we've talked about some broad theories of motivation, such as instinct, drive, and arousal. Now we're going to jump into talking specifically about our motivation to eat. Hunger motivation is this amazing area of psychology because eating is something that takes up a lot of our time and a lot of our thoughts as a human species. And we know there's lots of things out there that can make us hungry. For instance, just seeing food can make us hungry, even when you weren't hungry beforehand. This is the idea of you're scrolling through social media and people are posting pictures for recipes, or if you're watching late night TV and there's a commercial for something delicious, all of a sudden it can make you feel very hungry. This can even happen if you're watching something with no commercials. Like let's say you're watching a show on Netflix and the characters keep eating and drinking. That can make you become thirsty and hungry just by those visual cues. We also know without seeing or talking about food, you can become hungry just by other types of environmental cues, such as certain times a day. If all of a sudden you realize, oh, hey, it's 6 p.m., I should have supper. Even if you're not hungry for supper, knowing what time of day it is may make you feel you're obliged to eat and all of a sudden you then become hungry. Or you're not hungry at all, but you pass by a refrigerator or you're driving down the street and you pass by the restaurant that you used to go to. All these types of place, temporal, and visual cues can make our desire to eat increase. In addition, we find there's a lot of science behind what makes us not just eat, but overeat. Sometimes we tend to eat beyond the point of satiation due to a number of different things. For instance, if there's just more food available. Let's say if you order a medium pizza to split between three friends, you might just eat a little bit. Versus if you order an extra large pizza to split between three friends, you tend to eat more. And that's because there's more food available, so you'll just continue to eat. We've actually shown through studies that those who uh, put the food on the table and share it once it's on the table, known as family style serving, tend to eat more food per meal than those who just leave the food on the stove or on the kitchen counter and don't bring in extra food to the table. We also tend to eat more when there's not just more of one thing, but more diversity in general. For instance, at a buffet that maybe has six different hot entree options, you'll eat a certain amount. But if there was 12 different hot entree options, you will eat much more because you'll take a ladle full of each option and overall you'll eat a lot more food. So increasing the diversity also increases the amount of food we eat. And finally, we know that by increasing portion sizes, we will dramatically eat more even beyond the point of satiation. Through enlarging dinner plates or increasing the sizes of beverage, we tend to consume and eat much more food than we would have if plates or serving sizes were smaller. So there's lots of environmental cues that can trick us into eating when we're not actually hungry or trick us into eating more than we actually desire. But what about the biological side of things? We actually know there's complicated biological pathways that make us want to eat food. And this includes both our short-term appetite and our long-term energy balance. So in terms of the short-term, our short-term appetite is really pushed by our blood sugar levels or our glucostatic system. So the glucostatic hypothesis suggests that the amount of sugar that's in our blood will provide us with feedback to the hypothalamus in our brain. And this allows us to make judgments about when we want to eat and how much and what type of food we want to eat. For instance, if you have pretty stable blood sugar, if you're snacking on very healthy things like fruits or nuts during the day, and you're thinking about lunch, you might say, huh, well, I'm actually feeling like I want to have a healthful lunch. And you might reach out and get a salad. If your blood sugar is pretty stable and pretty balanced, that tends to be the choice. You can rationally think about a healthful option. Versus if your blood sugar is kind of a little bit down and you're starting to feel a little bit hungry, you might say, well, actually, I kind of am craving a bit more carbs. So you'll be looking for something a bit more carbohydrate rich, perhaps a pasta or something with potatoes or rice, something that's going to give you a lot of starches, which can be broken down into sugars. And let's say that you worked past your lunch hour and now your blood sugar is crashing and you're very much aware that you were hungry. Perhaps you're even in the realm of hangry. If you're so much in a rush to balance out those blood sugars, if you have a choice in the matter, now you don't want the healthful salad or the carbohydrate rich pasta. Now what you're looking for is very simple carbs, very, very sugary foods, like something rich like chocolate cake. 
or something that's going to get your sugar up as fast as it can. This is the idea that if you start to skip meals or do intermediate fasting, it can actually cause you to eat meals that are not so healthful, eat meals that are lower in fiber and lower in protein because you're just prioritizing the sugar rich foods to help balance your blood sugar. What's really interesting about this short-term appetite theory is it also gives us some negative feedback. It allows us to know when to stop eating. And one of the primary reasons is through stomach distension, when our tummies actually feel expanded. This gives us feedback in our brain to let us know, okay, you're full now. However, sometimes we ignore it for everything I just explained in terms of our environmental cues. But even if you learn to ignore the external cues of the size of your plate and just these internal cues, it's important to understand that you should be eating more frequently and more healthful rather than eating less frequently and eating things that are not so healthy for your system. In addition to the short-term theory, we also have to think about the long-term energy balance. And this is can sometimes be called the lipostatic approach. And it's called the lipostatic approach because rather than dealing with our blood sugar, it's really dealing with the feedback we receive from our fat cells in our body. And so this is dealing with two long-term hormones. We have the hormone ghrelin and the hormone leptin. So ghrelin is an appetite stimulator. It's produced from your stomach and it tends to be produced around the same time every day based on your previous habits. So what often happens here in ghrelin, it is our uh, more faded teal arrows in the top row. Our ghrelin tends to be low while we're sleeping. And as soon as we wake up in the morning, we get a huge spike of ghrelin saying, oh, I'm hungry. And then we eat our breakfast. And as soon as we eat our breakfast, our ghrelin goes down. Then it might stay down till the next time we typically eat during the day, which could be lunch. And it spikes up around midday around lunch until we eat again, then it goes down. Spikes up again around supper and then goes down. And then we hope it stays stable during the night. And so ghrelin is this really interesting hormone because it can be released not just through this, but it can also be released when we are doing what's called emotional eating. Let's say somebody is very emotionally upset and they find themselves crying. Sadness as an emotion can actually release ghrelin in our system. If you ever really had a bad day or a breakup or really bad news and you cried to cope with that experience, that crying can actually release ghrelin in your body. And now it's not just imagined hungriness, you are legitimately hungry and your body wants food. You're, you're gonna start producing the acid in your stomach to break down food, the saliva in your mouth is gonna be there and you are genuinely hungry. So now what's gonna happen is you're going to eat to satisfy that. And that emotional eating is real. We also find that unfortunately ghrelin can go up and up and up if we start to diet. For instance, after we eat a good meal that is pretty much similar to what we used to eat in the past, our ghrelin will go back down pretty low. But let's say we try and diet and we try to only eat half of our breakfast or half of our lunch. Well, then the ghrelin will not go down all the way. What happens in chronic dieters is even after they eat their diet portion of a meal, they're still as hungry as a non-dieter before the meal. This becomes not an issue of willpower now, but an issue of our biology is out of homeostasis and our body is constantly trying to push to make everything be back and balanced and to get that ghrelin back to its base level, which is now why we're going to be fighting against ourselves to ignore that drive of to ignore those hunger pains. We also have a second hormone that's really important in here and it's called leptin and leptin is an appetite suppressor. Now, although ghrelin is produced in the stomach, leptin is actually produced in our fat cells. And this is the feedback we get from our fat cells to let us know we're satiated. And so it works in very much a complementary fashion to ghrelin. You can see the arrows going in the opposite ways. Leptin is pretty high while we're asleep to let us know that we're full and we don't need to eat while we're asleep. But then it dips down as ghrelin goes up. As ghrelin goes up, leptin goes down in the morning to get us hungry for breakfast as we eat, that's what produces the leptin and suppresses the ghrelin. And we do not desire to eat again until our leptin goes low and our ghrelin goes high again. They work in opposite fashions throughout the day. And so what happens here is when leptin's high, we're not hungry. When leptin's low, we are hungry. Now what's really interesting here is scientists have attempted to give non-human animals injections of leptin to see if that would be an appetite suppressor to help with dieting. We actually find it doesn't work and that's because we quickly adjust to the new baseline of leptin and so it doesn't help support dieting. 
What this theory also lets us know, especially with how fat cells work, is this really important idea known as the set point theory. So set point theory is the idea that our fat cells really dictate how this leptin is produced and how we know when we're satiated. But our fat cells also require a lot of energy and a lot of calories. Now our fat cells never go away, meaning if you have a certain number of fat cells, those are the same fat cells you'll have for the rest of your life. However, you can shrink your fat cells over time. When you are eating very healthfully in a very restrictive diet, your fat cells can actually shrink. But when you overeat or you binge during the holidays, your fat cells grow and they don't just grow, they also multiply. Meaning every time you really overeat on a holiday, you don't just make your fat cells grow, but now you get new ones. And those new ones will be there for the rest of your life. And although you can shrink those new ones, you can never get rid of them. Because of this, set point theory has argued that crash dieting actually leads to more significant weight gain over the lifespan. So let's explain it. Let's say a person starts off pretty slim and they gain a little bit of weight and their, fat cell, and their fat cells multiplied a little bit, and now they wanna crash diet back to their previous size. In order to get that slim again, they have to be really, really, really restrictive, and it's really hard to hold that smaller size because they actually have more fat cells, and they're trying to hold them at a smaller level. This is gonna be really difficult because of that cycle of leptin and ghrelin in our system. So if you were once the second size and you're holding yourself back and being really restrictive on the first size, you're going to crash and eventually you're going to crash. And what's going to happen is when you give in a little bit and eat a little bit, your fat cells are quickly going to uh, regain what they can and they might even grow and multiply again. What now is going to lead to is you're going to have a higher baseline for your, your set point is going to now be higher. And so now you're a bigger size than what you want. So you go on a restrictive diet again and now in order to get down, you can't get down to your first size, maybe you get down to the second size and you're really happy with that, but it's not a matter of willpower. It's a, will, it's a matter of hormone homeostasis that you can't control. And eventually you're going to cave and the next set point you're gonna reach is going to be a larger one. We find that over time, crash dieters, every time they relapse, they end up a larger size than they were before the diet. And this is one of the many reasons why the diet industry continues to make lots of money because if they hook someone on one diet and it doesn't work, they'll just produce another diet or another book or another guide pitching them something else because they know they're desperate. If they know the first diet didn't work, they're going to be even more desperate now as their set point continues to increase. So we know that crash dieting is not advocated for because gradually the fat cells are going to multiply and grow to such an extent that one's going to be having much more hard time keeping their body in a healthful range. We also know that your set point is biologically determined. Some individuals are just always going to have more fat cells and always going to have fat cells that are at a larger size. And it's not something that they have control over. We also know that your set point increases with age and our metabolism slows down and our body wants to hold onto our fat in a different manner as we move through our 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. And it's important to understand that sometimes our sense of hunger is not within our control because of this biological component. That being said, there's lots of environmental stuff we can take account for, but we shouldn't ignore the biological metrics behind hunger.